written by Sami Al Jarjawi, born in 1994, at Tufa. The hour that I hate most in the day is 12 noon. Every time the exams start, I feel that the war will start again. I can't answer any of the exam questions and, and thoughts keep floating around in my head till I'm sick of them. I ask myself, is what's happening to me normal or am I sick? People say the Sea of Gaza washes all pains, but my pain is bigger than the sea. Because the last time I was at the sea, I was with my friend. We swam, played, and had fun. But, but now I can't go to the sea anymore. The Taladani Street is near the petrol station. And the petrol was dear to people and expensive. It was a big deal to have a liter of petrol. There was a war going on, and people were afraid of buying anything. My dad sent me to buy petrol. After I bought it, I went to the house of my friend Zeki, who lives near the station. I was missing him a lot and hadn't seen him for more than 10 days. I got to his house and I was in a hurry because my dad wanted me to return quickly with the petrol. I went inside their house without knocking the door. His mom considers me like her son and me too. I said hello to her and to my friend, hugged him, then kissed him, said hello to his brothers and quickly left. When there were 20 meters between me and their house, I heard the loud sound of a plane. And after the sound of a rocket falling on my friend's house, people started screaming that the house was burned. I couldn't believe it. I looked back at my friend's house and saw fire and smoke coming out of it. I'd never seen anything like that. I went back running to our house. When I got there, my dad told me, your friend died. No, he didn't. Everyone started telling me your friend, Zaki died, and I didn't believe them. That's why I didn't go to the funeral, or the hospital, or the cemetery, because Zaki didn't die. I always talk to him at night. Well, not exactly to him, to his photo. I'm very upset with him because he doesn't come visit me. And I also stopped visiting him at home. I'm sure he's not dead. And for sure, there will come a day when we meet. Then I'll blame him because I miss him so much. Written by Fatima Abu Hashem, age 14, born 1996, Al Street. When I talk to Palestinian kids in Europe, I feel sorry for them, and I don't wish to be like them because they are in diaspora. They plant their dreams in a land that's not theirs. Dreams grow with the people and the country. I love life, love to play, and love people. I wish I could be the president of Palestine for one day so I can enrich love and peace between people, end the hatred and spite in their hearts, and end the internal division. This will be my first presidential decision. Unfortunately, I'm not the president, and that's why there was a war. The war opened up with bombing like rain. We came running out of the school in fear and found the whole wall running in the street. People were looking for their sons and sisters and mothers. Everyone was running with their heads raised to the sky. Honestly, they look strange. I saw one of them from the distance wearing pajamas, barefoot and running. When I first saw her, I didn't recognize her, but when I got close to her, wow, 
that's my uncle's wife. The chief man who doesn't leave the house without looking top touch. Then I was sure the war has started. It's been more than a year since we have been talking about the war. We live it and continue to live it each day in detail. Because the TV, the phone, and the doorbell are all things that remind me of the war, and I don't like them. You know, even I threw away my mobile. And I must have scared of being alone. I think, what would I do if a war starts and I am alone? Who will protect me? And when I am with the family, I start to think how I will protect them. I had a big dream to become an actress. This dream starts to shrink slowly because people in my country don't look at the, an actress in a positive way. Even though acting is important and allows me to rely the picture of the suffering of my country and society to the world. I have a second dream if the first doesn't work out to be journalist. And the third dream is to make a family that I love and who love me. And the fourth is for me to be free and for the flag in Palestine to fly freely. And the fifth is to see people happy without death, destruction, deprivation or war. And the sixth and the last is for me to finish this monologue and come down from the stage. Written by Reem Afana, born in 1996 on Al Saftawi Street. When I was young, I used to feel that I was the happiest child in the world. But the more I grow, and my mind grows, the more my worry grows, because I start to understand things that I did not. I start to know the meaning of a deprived child. The thing that upsets me and makes me cry the most are children's tears. All children in the world, regardless of their nationality, religion, or color. When I grow up, I want to be a pediatrician, and that's the hope that gives me a big push in life, even though I'm fed up and bored and sad because Gaza doesn't have life anymore. Yesterday, I was sitting in school and I heard the sound of planes. I got really scared. I wanted to run away from school. I felt I was going to die because I remembered the war. The scenes of war won't leave my mind. On the third day of the war, my family was sitting together, talking about what was happening in the war, and my grandmother was reassuring us so we wouldn't be scared. We were actually calmed, even though the sound of rockets didn't stop, but my grandmother's warm voice was calming us. And then the phone rang. The lines never caught in the war, so when we heard the sound of the phone, we were happy. Hello? Yes? This is the Israeli Defense Army. You have five minutes to clear the house. It is for your own benefit. We have warned you. I couldn't stand on my legs anymore. Everyone in the house started yelling. My grandmother was the first one to run away. It was the first time I'd seen her going so fast. My dad held me and my sisters and told us not to be scared. He was pulling me to leave, but I was going to die if I didn't take my teddy bear with me. I felt that I would betray him if I left him under the bombing. I escaped from dad's hands and ran to my bear took him in my arms, and left. We all got far away from the house and sat down to wait for the five minutes. They were the longest five minutes in history. They became ten. We felt there were years that were passing. I was in a whirlwind, thoughts and dreams thrashing about in my head. The whole world was spinning. I felt that that dream of being a doctor was very, very far away. I held a bear and remembered myself when I was small how I was laughing. I want to go back to being small and stay small. I don't want to grow up. But the only thing that comforted me was the love of people who didn't leave us for one moment. Gaza is full of love. Gaza Malaluk, written by Suha Al Mamluk. Born 1995 at Tufar. Every day, Gaza changes. 
That's why my dreams always change. And each time I make a step forward, I go a hundred back. In the first heat of the war, I was going home from school and didn't know the road. Suddenly, a man stood in front of me and asked me, Where is your house? I told him, and he took me home. I went down the house quickly and asked my dad, Why did he come get me? My mum said, It's Nolo, dear. Go study. I told her, There are no exams. The war started. In the afternoon, they hit the government building near us. My mum said, It's normal. We are used to what is happening to us. We went running to the neighbours, each one looking out for himself. After minutes, the neighbours' relatives started coming and the house became packed with more than a hundred people in it. But still, things stayed normal for my mother. In the evening, my parents decided to go to the hospital and visit the injured, and I went with them. In the hospital, we saw many corpses. There were four on each bed, under and on top of each other. Only then, my mother said, this is not normal. The war isn't over. The war is big. And my fear is to grow up with it. I'm always scared of a new war. And if a balloon bursts, I'm scared. If a car hits a strong break, I jump 20 meters. And if a small kid yells, I start yelling with him. I stay up all night waiting for a new dawn. But each morning that comes does not differ from the one that passed. Written by Mahmoud Abu Shaban, born 1996 in Al Rima. You are going to call me crazy, nuts, cuckoo. Go ahead, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me anymore. In truth, what's happening with me is not normal. I mean, losing trust in my friends is normal. Lots of people have lost trust in others. But what's driving me crazy is that I have lost my trust in shop windows and cars, in police stations and suspicious areas. In my personal philosophy, all of Gaza is a suspicious area. To make a long story short, Everything that was hit in the war, I am scared of going near today. I don't know how to walk down the street. I'd be walking on the right and get scared. Then I'd move to the left, but I'd be scared. So I'd go back to the right and stay in that whirlwind. Where am I supposed to walk? In the middle of the street? See, on the first day of the war, as I was in my brother's shop that sells computers and mobile phone accessories. A medal fell on the floor, and my brother told me to hang it up. Suddenly, while hanging it up, I heard the sound of rockets, and the glass fell on me and injured me. I was scared. I wasn't scared for myself, but for my brother. He was also injured. He was worried about our family. He told me, go up to the house and make sure they are okay. I went up the stairs, and I wasn't scared. I made sure they were all all right and they were all fine, thank God. I walked up the street to find out where the explosion happened. We heard a lot of explosions. Gaza became like a black night because of the smoke. But still I wasn't scared. I forgot to tell you that my brother had a cup of tea in the first explosion, which fell from his hand and broke. Just think, 
it was because of fear. It's written by Muhammad Qasim, born 1995, Al Saftawi Street. My grandmother and I were home alone. She was telling me stories about the days of our country, funny stories and sad ones. But she never told me a complete story because she always had to go to the bathroom halfway through. <laughs> My grandma spends half her time in the room and the other half in the bathroom. My parents came back at 10.30 at night and went to sleep straight away. I couldn't sleep. I was lying on my bed awake, writing my homework. Suddenly, I heard the noise of a distant explosion. I went to my parents' room and took the radio to hear the news. I woke my father up and told him, I heard the sound of a strong explosion. He said, be quiet and go to bed. It's just aimless shooting. Anyway, I went back to bed and the electricity was out. Suddenly, there was a huge explosion that shook my world. I pulled my blanket and covered my face and something fell on me. I raised the blanket off me with all my strength and it was the frame of the window that had fallen on me. The blanket was full of glass and our entire house was full of black smoke. It was the day they hit the workers' union right next to our house. But that's not the point. The point is the stupid things that happened and which I couldn't find an explanation for. First, the world was on fire and all we felt we would die. But my grandmother was looking for her false teeth. She was afraid that when she died, people would find out she had no teeth like they didn't know already. Second, the house was full of smoke, but my father lit a cigarette and smoked, as if we needed more smoke. Third, my uncle called to make sure we were okay, and my father told him that we are all fine, thank God, but that all the windows of the house were broken except one. My uncle told him to break it, and my father did. And I don't know why I'm telling this story. All I know is that, is, is that we are living in a cage, a prison, like an uncaged bird who wants to come out, but he's besieged. Kids are dying in front of their mother's eyes. Hearts are crying for them and screaming in the loudest voice. But no one hears. No one's heart softens and no one seems to care. A monologue by Ali Abu Yassin from Gaza, written in December 31st, 2023. To my library, please forgive me if I'm obliged to be away from you due to the months of war. You are the best to know the meaning of war and its ravages when Leo Tolstoy resides inside you with his masterpiece, War and Peace. How could you not when we have repeatedly reviewed the play Mother Courage and Her Children, which I decided one day to direct for the theater. I'm now no longer afraid of the horrors of war to harm you. You have possessed the courage and bravery of a mother in defending her children. So consider all those books and plays to be your children that you guard. My beloved library, you know that the electricity has been cut off for my family. People do not have any kind of fuel to cook food or bake their bread. I know that people search for a piece of wood or a piece of cardboard, like searching for a needle in a haystack. Please allow the people to take whatever books they want, if it will save their lives and feed their children. I know that my writer friends gave themselves for others my friends Chekhov, Albert Camus, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean Genet, Shakespeare, Mahmoud Darwish, Samih Al-Qasim, Ghannam Ghannam, Alfred Faraj, Atif Abu Saif, Al-Maghout, Saad Allah Wannous, Stanislavski, Augusto Bawal, 
and all the great ones sitting on your shelves are happy to be burnt candles to make others happy. But between us, these are bigger and more valuable than a few papers on which they are pre preserved. The world and I memorize what they wrote in our hearts before our minds. Therefore, I do not fear for my library, but all my fear is for the people whom books are found for. My precious library, you are truly precious. I will never forget the day I went to Cairo in 1993 to participate in the Cairo Festival for Arab Theatre performances. All my colleagues returned carrying gifts for their families and I returned with a large bag loaded to the brim with the most delicious types of theatre books. It was heavy and the travel was difficult. When I returned, my wife and children came to receive their gifts. They found Stanislavski smiling at them and saying, forgive me and forgive this crazy theatre lover. My beloved library, wait for me. Soon I will return to you. We'll stay up until dawn, exploring human souls, the beauty and strangeness of the world, the magic and beauty of words, and the splendor and greatness of writers. Written by Rima El Sadi. Born 1995 in Ash Sheikh Radwan. I was nine years old when we returned from the Emirates. It was the first time I visited Gaza. The car was moving along the street and I was looking out from the window. I didn't like anything in the city. When we stood at a traffic light, a lot of kids came to the car begging, selling gum and biscuits. Then I hated myself and wanted to go back to the Emirates. Since then, I have lived in Gaza and will not leave it, even if they give me a choice between it and Paris, because I discovered that the love inside it is enough for the whole world and that places are in their people, not in their buildings or views. Mom always talked to me about Gaza when we were in the Emirates. I liked it before I saw it. But once I lived in it, I liked it more. It has details that mom didn't see, but it's such a pity. All it needs is safety to be the most beautiful city in the world. In the war, the Taqwa Mosque and the Noor Mosque were bombed. And after that, the house of Abu al Kari. And the Abu al Kari house is our topic. They are our neighbors, and the Israeli secret services threatened them with bombing. People told us to live on the bottom floor. It's safer, so when they bomb the Abu al Kuri house, it won't hit us. We went down to the first floor and waited for the army to bomb Abu al Kuri's house. But they bombed the Noor Mosque instead. All its windows, doors, and stones flew on us while we were in the apartment. I was very injured. All the doors fell on my head. Of course, there was screaming and, and the house was in a total mess. The next day we had a family meeting and, and decided to go back to the upper flat. And we did. We, we moved to the top floor. But this time they hit the Taqwa Mosque. All the glass and stones flew on us in the top floor. So we decided to go down to the bottom floor because it's safer. And we sat and waited for the army to bomb the Abu al Kuri's house. And that night, they really did. They threw the first rocket, then the second, but it didn't explode. And if they threw another rocket and it hit the one that didn't explode, the whole neighborhood would have been wiped out. And people would have said, here was Abu al Kari's neighborhood.
This piece is written by Rowan Jaror Jasmine, born in 1997 in Alderaj. Relax, girls, don't be afraid. This is just the sound of aimless shooting. That's what our teacher said as soon as the bombing started. After a while, her mobile phone rang and she spoke a few words only. 120 martyrs? She smashed her mobile onto the floor and told us, go home, all of you. As soon as we went out into the yard, we saw our parents, some of them in pajamas, some in their undershirts, and some barefoot. We were very scared. My two sisters and I kept waiting for dad, but he was really late. So we decided to go home by ourselves, even though it's a long way. On the way, I saw something for the very first time. A martyr being carried on a coffin wrapped in the flag of Palestine, with banners around him and people crying. But the weird thing is that the funeral barely had 30 people in it. Funerals of martyrs usually have thousands. Then I felt that there was really something big, a big catastrophe going on in the country. I got scared for my father. I didn't want him to come get us because I was scared he'd be hit by a rocket. I was also scared of dying and I didn't want to die now because it would be a catastrophe if I died and no one came to the funeral. I started running home and people were running around us like it was doomsday. No one knew they were going. No one knew where they were going because the sound of rockets didn't stop. Every few seconds, a rocket would fall and shake the ground. I felt that the streets were not the same streets, nor were the people the same people. Strange sights, strange sounds, and strange smells. After the war, a lot of things changed inside me. I started hating going to the bathroom. From the second I went in, I couldn't wait to come running out because all the time in the war, I was afraid they'd hit a rocket on our house when I was in the bathroom. In there, no one would be in a great focus and you know the rest. I also started hating the morning line at school. When the war started, I was in the line. That's why today I feel that the minutes in the line are hours of fear and worry. All school for me is one pile and the line is another. I started having horrifying dreams. All night, I have a conflict within me between desire to sleep and fear of having nightmares. Sleep became a monster, hiding behind my eyelids. I stay like that till morning. I don't know when I slept and when I woke up. I want to become an actress someday. And this is a hard dream to fulfill in Gaza, especially for girls. I tell myself it's a shame for people in Gaza to be deprived of my talent because I could become an actress, an important one. But if they don't want me, to hell with them. I'll go to any country and act there. Gazans are deprived of everything anyway. It doesn't just stop at theatre. Sometimes I think people in Gaza can barely find food. How are they going to go to the theatre? You know, 
I wish I could live in a civil democratic society with peace and 20 cinemas and keep watching movies all day long and flying in my imagination and dreams. A monologue written by Ali Abu Yassin, January 8th, 2024. Real News Bulletin. Dear readers, here's the detailed news bulletin as it came to us from Dar al-Balah. On the political level, two weeks ago, citizens were following with passion and interest the news of the Egyptian paper related to the truce but after it continued to fluctuate between amendments, dialogues, freezes, and providing and withdrawing hope, this led to a state of extreme frustration among the citizens. And they began following the vine leaves, the mluchie, and the spinach to cook something for their children to eat. And the vast majority refrained from the following news. On the economic level, Citizens are still surprised by the skyrocketing prices of goods, which go down a little and go up a lot. What is certain is that prices now in Gaza may be the most expensive in the world. For example, one kilo of sugar costs $7, one liter of cooking oil costs $6, and a kilo of rice costs $8. Of course, in general, Goods are scarce, if they exist. But the game of hide and seek is very present in the economy. Sometimes salt, sugar, oil, yeast, and flour disappear from the markets. Enter, and after a few days, you find them reappearing at ridiculous prices. For example, a kilogram of salt jumps from a quarter of a dollar to $10 and measure that. Recently, it has been observed that the market has been flooded with chips, soft drinks and donuts, and of course, at ridiculous prices. In light of the absence of the basics needed by the household, such as rice, sugar and flour, on the other hand, car drivers are still maintaining the, their solidarity with the citizens and express their national affiliation by maintaining the price of one shekel per passenger from the cannon to the camp and vice versa. Despite the prices of everything, if you want to take a special order donkey, the price varies according to the request. On the social level, people have less contact with each other. To check on each other after hundreds of failed attempts as a result of poor communication and the poor psychological state of the majority of the people. Silence, waiting, and boredom became the master of the situation. During our conversation with one citizen, how does he spend his day? He told us that he spends all day running from one place to another to provide his family with food for the day. And when the evening comes, he stays awake until the morning from the place of displacement in which he resides, dreaming of the return to his home, to his bed, and the day he will wake up in his home, sipping quietly his coffee. Written by Muhammad Afana, 1995, on Al Safitawi Street. If you want to call me a coward, do so. After the war, I do not answer any kid who swears at me or even hits me. I am just sad. I leave him and walk away. Before the war, I wasn't like that. The flying bird would avoid me. Why did this happen to me? Because, honestly, after I saw so many kids dying in the war, I started to feel that all of us are going to die. It's just a bit delayed. I said to myself, kid, you are a lot bigger than that. I started to feel that I was a hundred years old. The war ended on the ground, but it is still there in my head. I want to be like any child in this world. Not 
in the world, but at least Jerusalem. When I chat to my cousins who live in Jerusalem on the net, I feel that they are living their childhood and they do not think like me at all. I am scared to tell them what I am thinking so that they don't think that I am weird. I pretend to be listening to them and I lie to them. They did not live what we lived in the war. My family and that of my uncle and grandfather all went to live at my uncle's and aunt's place because it was far away from the war and it was a safe area, or so we thought. The next day, there was a bombing on the street next to my uncle's house and the wall behind the house collapsed. The third day, my uncle, at whose house we were staying, went to buy for beans and falafel for breakfast. When he returned, he parked the car at the door of his house. Before he went down from the car, a rocket fell on him. The upper half of his body fell on our surface. And when the ambulance came, they took out the lower half from the car. The paramedics went and collected the upper half in a plastic bag and they took him to a hospital. Everyone started yelling and screaming and my mother started asking God to bring him back safe. I don't know, was she lying to herself or to us? Of course my uncle did not come back and he won't come back safe. Written by Yasmin Abu Amr, born 1996 in Shuja'iya. I want to be a specialist in the science of metaphysics, what is behind nature. You know why? Because I think that Gaza itself is behind nature. And I got so much from my presence here in Gaza that I'd like to transfer my skill to others. The Shuja'iya camp is always the center of events. Each time the occupation wants to invade Gaza, they pass by our house. When the war began, people left their houses thinking that Shuja'iya would be hit. It's normal in this case to leave our house. Everyone was calling my dad to convince him to leave the house. My brothers from Algeria, my uncles from the States, my uncles from Ankara. The whole world was begging my dad and he wouldn't budge refusing to leave Shuja'iya. Three days with my mom having packed the house stuff and we're in suspended travel mode. We want to go to my sister's house because it's safer there. After we were exhausted from talking, he agreed and said, you go and I'll follow. How can we go and leave him? My mom was smart. She left bread at home. And you know how dear bread was in the war. As soon as we got to my sister's house, she called him and said, Salman, we forgot the bread. Bring it for us. And Salman fell in the trap and brought the bread and we wouldn't let him leave. The next morning, we woke up to a phosphorus bomb that fumed the street. We all started crying, our tears falling because of the phosphorus. The bomb was easier on us than dad's taunting. He said, I told you let's stay home. It's better for us. There's no place like home. And on it went. What added fuel to the fire is that the mosque and house next to my sister's house were destroyed in the bombing. And you can imagine what my dad did to us. He wanted to take us back to the home immediately. No sooner had he finished his words than we were told that the house next to us in Shuja'iya was bombed and the front of our house ripped off. Then for the first time, all of us looked at dad. We stayed at my sister's place. It became clear to us that wherever we went in Gaza, in the war, we were not safe. After the war, I started to always dress in a clean and tidy way.
so that if I die, I would die a nice death. But it would be the biggest problem if I was hit by a rocket because I would become a hundred pieces and I'd like to die in one piece. Wow. Gaza and Gaza's dreams. Our dream has become to die a good death and not live a good life.